this evening uh, we have a special event for you where we will be, again be looking to join with our partners across the region in bringing this session to you. Um, this evening we are going to have in um, doing our presentation for us, we will have none other than the Honorable Tony Gibbs, um, who has been an engineer in Barbados and this region for um, quite a while. And we're also going to have Mr. Fazir Khan, um, who is a director of Alpha Engineering and Design um, in Trinidad and Tobago. I'll give you a bit more information on both gentlemen shortly. Uh, just want to remind you, this is a CPD, Continual Professional Development Event, and it's worth two points. So please do contact the BAP office to claim um, your CPD points um, for the event. Just to give you an idea of the format for this evening, we will have a brief introduction by Lieutenant Colonel Trevor Brown, President of the Barbados Association of Professional Engineer. He's also the president of the, or the Council of Caribbean Engineer Organization. And following that, we will have a presentation by engineer Tony Gibbs. We will have some comments following that by engineer Fazir Khan. And then we will have a 20 to 30 minute question and answer segment. And we will probably be wrapping up around 7.30. So, Without further ado, I would invite Lieutenant Colonel Brown to give some comments, and then I will introduce Mr. Gibbs. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Vincent Jones. Um, members of the CCCO committee, um, I see um, Professor Mellows is with us. I think Jerry Medford is also going to join us. Members of the BAP, Board of Directors or Committee of Management, members of the um, Industry Liaison Committee from the St. Augustine campus of UE, um, the Honorable Tony Gibbs, our main presenter, and Engineer Fazir Khan. Ladies and gentlemen, the CCEO is particularly pleased to jointly with the APE host this webinar on the important topic of engineering reform in the Caribbean and to look at it in 2021. We became aware that the Industry Liaison Committee of the St. Augustine campus of UWA had been seriously debating issues related to the academic preparation of our future regional engineers. And I must tell you, we were happy when they readily agreed to share some of their thoughts and their concerns with the wider regional engineer fraternity by way of this medium, the, the BAP monthly seminar on what we consider to be a particularly important topic for this region. Now, ladies and gentlemen, by any measure, this is a region that is in serious crisis. We were already behind the developmental curve before the COVID crisis. And from all reports, things have regionally and, and to be quite honest, globally, taken a definite turn for the worse over the last two years. As professional engineering bodies and professional engineers in this region, we believe there are a number of questions that we need to ask ourselves. And I would like to briefly outline a couple of those questions even before um, our two special guests from the Industry Liaison Committee make their substantive presentation. The main question is this, what is the role for engineering in response to this regional and indeed global crisis of underdevelopment? Now, while we fully endorse the liaison committee's work, we at CCEO are beginning to wonder if an even more rigorous and fundamental review of the engineering profession itself and of the reforms needed for the mid 21st century is not urgently warranted. And if this session may, should not be the beginning of such a review. Since the beginning of time, and I, and I like to say that it is said that engineering is this world's second oldest profession. And since the beginning of time, that profession 
has been about the business of solving the complex problems that arise in human societies. What this has meant was conceptualizing the most appropriate solutions to the current threats faced by societies through the ages, while at the same time being the ones responsible for innovating and creating the new realities that were designed to drive those societies forward. Now, obviously, the specifics have changed as societies change over the centuries. For example, when the term engineer was coined in France for our profession, it devolved from the military engines, quote unquote, that were created around that time to protect those societies from what they then considered to be the existential threats of invasion and defeat by neighboring warring tribes, so to speak. Similarly, over the last 70 years after World War II and after the creation of our University of the West Indies, engineering tended to be associated with technology and infrastructural development, naturally because these were the areas where international and interorganizational competitiveness and social developmental focus tended to be placed during that time. That was the time of industrial and, and, uh, and quality growth and all that. But 22 years into the 21st century, there are three questions I would like us to think about. One, is it not true that our world is now exponentially more complex than it has ever been in the history of this world and largely so because of technology? That would appear to be unquestionably true. And what that says is that there are not many people in this world who are equipped to understand and decipher the complex concepts that underpin the world in which we live. We live in an extremely complex world thanks largely to engineers and to technology. The next question is, what are indeed the current and the future complex problems and threats that face the society of 2021, this region in, and talk about now and in the next months and years? Are these threats not things like climate change and global warming and global pollution and the coming inevitable global water crisis? Is COVID-19 not perhaps the most significant threat facing our societies? Is the threat of conflict and war and famine not the, kind, the, 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 the serious existential crises that we face as communities? So then my final question is, who will be the engineers, quote unquote, that will ex that will address these present and immediate future existential threats to our current societies and to our children and grandchildren? Are we saying that this is now a role for politicians and lawyers and social scientists when throughout history, it is engineers who understand the sciences and understand how this world works that have taken the lead in solving these problems? Do we need a complete rethink of engineering at this stage of the 21st century? I would like to think that this session, and I really honestly want to say a, a special thanks to the Honorable Tony Gibbs for actually for leading this session, for bringing it to the fore, and actually for, for, for getting us thinking in this way. But I really hope from CCO's perspective that this is the beginning of a review that can make a massive difference in this region of engineering playing its true role in moving the Caribbean region forward. Thank you, Mr. Master of Ceremonies, and I actually look forward to the presentations tonight. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Colonel Brown. Now, this evening's presentation, as was alluded to, the title is Caribbean Engineering Reform from Student Selection to Professional Registration. And leading us off, um, or I should say at the crease, um, opening the baton this evening, it's going to be none other than the Honorable Tony Gibbs. Um, 
Engineer Gibbs would have received the accolade of the Companion of Honor um, from the People and Government of Barbados in the Independence Honor List in 2020 for his sterling contribution in the field of engineering in Barbados and the Caribbean. Just to give you a brief overview of um, engineering Gibbs' profession, uh, sorry, uh, yes, his professional um, career. Um, engineer Gibbs would have been born in Grenada um, he would have gone to about 10 schools in four Caribbean islands, Grenada, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and Trinidad, before attending two universities in Northern Ireland and England, and having lived in two more islands, Jamaica and Barbados. So the quintessential Caribbean man. Um, he, he, the latter being his home since 1965. He came to work on the first Hilton Hotel for two years, and he's still working here. And we have benefited immensely from his um, sojourn here with us. Engineer Gibbs would have headed the firm, the local engineering firm, Consulting Engineers Partnership Limited in Barbados from 1965 to 1996. During which period, he was responsible for over 1,500 projects in the Caribbean, including in Barbados, the life of Barbados in Wildey, which is now the Sajigor headquarters, the Central Bank of Barbados and the Frank Colomer Hall, the General Post Office in Bridgetown, the Grant Lee Adams International Airport Terminal Building Phase 1 in 1979, the Control Tower, the Caribbean Development Bank, um, the Cable and Wireless Headquarters in Wildey, the Holiday Inn, which is now the Radisson in Barbados, and the Bank of Nova Scotia on Broad Street. He also would have worked on several projects throughout the region, including the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank in St. Kitts, the Government Headquarters in St. Vincent, Police Headquarters in Antigua, the Holiday Inn in Trinidad, and Public Market in Dominica. Mr. Gibbs continues, continues as a consultant to the firm of Consulting Engineering Partnership Limited, um, and at that time in uh, December, he was currently still working on projects in Guyana, Grenada, St. Lucia, and Belize, as well as Barbados. Engineer Gibbs is the past vice president of the Institute of Structural Engineers in the United Kingdom from 1990 to 1991, and a past president of the Barbados Association of Professional Engineers from 73 to 74. He's also uh, the Secretary General of the Council of in, uh, Caribbean Engineering Organizations from 2005 to 2020, a member of the Governing Board of the Global Earthquake Model 2011 to 2013, a member of the Scientific Planning Group on Natural Hazard Risk Reduction of the International Science Council for Latin America and Caribbean, Director of the American Association for Wind Engineering, a member of the International Codification Forum of the International Association of Wind Engineering, Deputy Chairman of the Barbados National Council of Science and Technology, and Associate Project Manager for the Caribbean Uniform Building Code, and Chairman of Barbados Metric Metrification Board. Clearly, Mr. Gibbs has a lifetime of experience, which we are happy to benefit from this evening. Engineer Gibbs, without further ado, I invite you to uh, present, sir. So I now have to share the screen, right? Yes, sir. That's right. And I have to put on the... The sound. Share the sound. Okay. Share the screen. You let me know if it's if it's coming up all right. Yes, uh, we can see it. So, can you see the first, the yes, the title of the? All clear, sir. You're good to go. Okay, so this evening I'll be talking about Caribbean engineering reform from student selection to registration. The title of my presentation was given to me by. Trevor Brown, chair of the CCEO, and I accepted the title. So let's get, get into it right away. Now, to enter university, you have to, uh, to satisfy the 
matriculation requirements. And engineers would have included in those requirements, usually A-level mathematics and English as an acceptable level of the Caribbean Examinations Council. <clears throat> I was at a meeting at St. Augustine about two years ago or three years ago, where I learned that the UWI Civil Engineering Department actually has to undertake remedial mathematics for people who come to them with A-levels, with advanced levels, CXEs, um, or is it CAPE, I think, um, uh, results. And, of, and in the course, in the exist, the present course for civil engineering at UWI, there is a two credit course in English language. I think that we have to go back to the CXC and ask them what they're doing about the standards, the mathematics and English language, which they are um, examining our students in because it seems to me, based on the UWI experience at St. Augustine, that those standards are not adequate. Now, in the Commonwealth Caribbean, we have a proliferation of institutions offering degrees in engineering. So let's look at them. There's a Faculty of Engineering at UWI St. Augustine, University of Guyana, the University of Trinidad and Tobago, University of Technology in Jamaica, and the, the new Faculty of Engineering at UWI at Mona, which is different from the Faculty of Engineering of St. Augustine. So there are two faculties of engineering at UWI. There's a fac Faculty of Science and Technology at the University of Belize, and the University of the Bahamas has a Faculty of Pure and Applied Sciences. Regrettably, at present, None of them offers a professional level first degree in, in engineering. Now, our communities in the Caribbean re do require the full spectrum of skills from artisans through technicians and technician engineers to the highest level of professionals. And that highest level of professionals requires formal educational programs at least as demanding as those in any other country of the world. And I will tell you why soon. The demands on the civil engineering profession, of which I am part, in the Caribbean are at least as great as those in other regions of the world. So in civil engineering, we have to deal with hurricane winds, torrential rain, waves, storm surge, earthquakes, tsunami, and volcanic activity. That's, that generates quite a lot of excitement in our lives. So <clears throat> hurricanes, this is the hurricane's impact on every part of the Caribbean. We even had a strong hurricane going through the south of Trinidad in 1933. And in 1963, there was a major hurricane which made a direct hit on Tobago. And those are the southernmost places in the, in the Commonwealth Caribbean. But everywhere in the Caribbean has been impacted by hurricanes. And when, they, when a hurricane makes a direct hit on a small island in the Caribbean, the losses are of the order of magnitude of the gross domestic product. So here are some examples in recent years. Hurricane David in 1979 in Dominica, 100% of GDP. Hugo in Montserrat in 89, 250% of GDP. Luis in Dutch St. Martin in 1995, 200% of GDP. Ivan in Grenada and Ivan in Cayman, both in 2004, and both suffered 180% of GDP in direct losses. And more recently, 
Maria in Dominica was 220% of GDP in direct losses. Now, if one of those events were to make a direct hit on Barbados, in 24 hours, we in Barbados would lose 5.21 billion US dollars. And if those, one of those events made a direct hit on Port of Spain, Trinidad, the losses could be of the order of 22 billion US dollars. That's billion with a B. So these are very significant events. So we need an institution which, uh, which educates our, our graduates to deal with these matters. And then we have torrential rain. Well, every year there are losses because of flooding. And the, the, on the left of the screen, you see an example of intensity, duration, frequency curves for a lo particular location in Barbados. But these IDF curves are not commonly available throughout the Commonwealth Caribbean. And this is an essential tool for rational stormwater drainage design. So most of the stormwater drainage design in the Commonwealth Caribbean is a slightly better than guesswork. So we have losses every year. And even at UWI campus in St. Augustine, we had major flooding in August 2009. You can see the pictures on the right-hand side of the screen. And then we have waves. We have wave action. Now the wave action is sometimes accompanying hurricanes, but you have wave action without hurricanes. And it was wave action that caused Nevis, the island of Nevis, there we are, Nevis, to lose its entire economy for 24, for 12 months from late 1999 to late year 2000 because of wave action. So many of our economic um, strength in many of the islands resides close to the ocean. So wave action is significant. And then we have storm surge. Now storm surge is not a big issue in the small islands of the Eastern Caribbean, but it's a significant issue in Belize, Hurricane Hattie in 1961 caused damage. And I saw a movie at the time in 19, 1962, I'm sorry, 1962. I saw a movie. I think we have a Belizean with us. Is it 61 or 62? It may have been 61. Yeah. A movie showing the, 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 the waves. Oh, sorry. Storm surge. It was rose. 61 rose to the second story of buildings in Belize City. You also have significant storm surge in the Bahamas and on the north coast of Jamaica, but not in the Eastern Caribbean. And then we have earthquakes. Almost all of the countries in the Caribbean have an earthquake hazard to deal with, the exception being the Bahamas. So, <clears throat> And those earthquakes sometimes generate tsunamis. The tsunami that we are concerned about in this part of the world could be generated by, an, by a subterranean volcano called Kikamjenin, north of Grenada. And that tsunami would be a more significant event in the northeast of the Caribbean than in the islands of the Windward Islands, which ironically closer to the event, but not as if impacted by the tsunami as those in the Northeast because of bathymetry. And the, one of the greatest natural hazard events in the history, in the post-Columbian history of the Caribbean was a tsunami generated 
on the 1st of November, 1755, by the earthquake in Lisbon, Portugal. And that earthquake generated a tele tsunami which crossed the Atlantic, more or less at the speed of sound, and impacted on all of the islands of the Caribbean and on the east coast of the USA. We have volcanic activity. Most of the islands of the Eastern Caribbean are volcanic. And these are not academic, this is not academic studies, but we do have volcanic, uh, active volcanoes in the Eastern Caribbean. Most recently, Soufriere in St. Vincent, that's the top right-hand corner of the screen, um, erupted, not for, the, not for the first time, because that, the bottom right-hand corner of the screen shows you an eruption from Good Friday in 1979. So both the Good Friday event of 1979 and the event earlier this year dumped ash on Barbados. In fact, the topsoil of Barbados comes from eruptions of the Soufriere volcano over many millennia. But all of that excitement, what that means is that the average Caribbean civil engineer has a need for broader and deeper knowledge and experience than the average counterpart in the United Kingdom, the United States of America, or Canada. And therefore, the logic is that the academic programs for civil engineers should be more demanding in the Caribbean than in the UK, the USA, or Canada. But is that the case? And then we have climate change. Have we got rid of Donald Trump yet? I'm not sure. <clears throat> so what is the evidence of climate change? It's with us already. In 2004, for the first time in recorded history, there was a hurricane in the South Atlantic. The first time in recorded history, there was a hurricane in the South Atlantic. It went into Brazil in March 2004. That same year, when Hurricane Ivan was between Tobago and Grenada on the website of the National Hurricane Center in Miami was a statement that Ivan was the most intense hurricane ever recorded so close to the equator in the North Atlantic. Four years later, there was Gustav. <clears throat> and in the west of Cuba, Gustav created a new world surface wind gust record. It was registered at the Paso Real de San Diego Meteorological Station in Pinar del Rio, Cuba. During Gustav, the anemometer, which you can see on the left, was rising as it broke, but as it, it rose to 340 kilometers per hour, 211 miles per hour when it broke. So let's go a bit further. What we have in the North Atlantic is a warming of the ocean. The green areas was what is known as the North Atlantic warm pool in the half decade 1920 to 1925. Go forward 40 years 
1960 to 1965, and that warm pool extended into the blue area. So now we have both the green and the blue as being part of the North Atlantic warm pool. Another 40 years brings us to this millennium. And from 2000 to 2005, the measurements indicated that the North Atlantic warm pool now extends right across the Atlantic to the west coast of Africa. So I don't suppose there are many doubters in the audience this evening about the existence of climate change. So what does that do to us? The number of tropical cyclones per year in the North Atlantic in the half century from 1960 to the year 2000 was 10, 10 tropical cyclones per year in the North Atlantic. The next decade from 2000 to 2010, the number of tropical cyclones per year increased to 14. And studies which were carried out in 2008 by by Georgia Tech indicated that by 2025, we'd be averaging between 15 and 20 tropical cyclones per year. And of those 15 and 20, three to four of them would be major hurricanes, category four and five hurricanes. So the conclusion is, that the combination of greenhouse warming and the natural variability of the multi-decadal cycles of the North Atlantic will produce unprecedented tropical cyclone activity in the coming decades. Well, so where are we as engineers? Recognizing the right engineering skills. We have the current situation, which indicates that the highest paid engineers are petroleum engineers, closely followed by airline pilots and flight engineers. And the lowest paid are the environmental engineers, closely followed by civil engineers. That's the current situation. And what the world and what the Caribbean needs is to reverse the situation and have the environmental engineers at the top, followed by civil engineers and airline pilots quite far down. And you notice we have gotten rid of the petroleum engineers completely, because most of the petroleum has to stay in the ground. That's how it should be. So the skills that are needed by the Caribbean include skills to dealing with energy efficiency, zero emission electricity, decarbonizing of industry, and carbon sequestration. That's what is needed. And at the bottom you see renewable energy, collaboration, systems thinking, creativity, solving complex problems. I think Trevor Brown alluded to that and critical thinking. That's where we are headed or where we should be headed. Now there are additional benefits if we support top class education and post-graduation professional development of engineers in the Caribbean. There are additional benefits. There are opportunities. The University of the West Indies Civil Engineering of St. Augustine has the potential to attract students from the rest of the world who are desirous of attending a highly ranked university and pursuing an education in civil engineering, which includes to a meaningful degree, dynamics, 
earthquake engineering, wind forces and structures, and coastal engineering. There are more opportunities. There are aspects of civil engineering peculiar to the Caribbean. We are the ones who should be leading research in these matters. There are other aspects of civil engineering in the Caribbean, which don't have commonplace application elsewhere. Our engineers should have a competitive advantage in these areas. So our engineers should be world leaders. We have that opportunity. We deal with our own problems and we help others deal with theirs. So let's, two, two slides ago, I talked about dynamics. Why is dynamics important? Why is the study of dynamics important? There are no civil engineering projects in the Caribbean, which is not impacted by one or more dynamic actions. Earthquakes are dynamic actions. Wind forces are dynamic actions. Wave actions are dynamic. And dynamics is best taught in a university setting. So we are trying to persuade the university to increase their, their teaching of dynamics to such an extent that people come out and ready to. So what you are seeing there, the building on a shake table, testing space isolation. Space isolation is a way, a way of producing safe economical structures in the world. But to do that, we need dynamics. This is what base isolators look like. And this is how they operate. The base isolators, in this case, the multi-sandwich of steel plates and rubber between the foundations the superstructure. If you're hearing music, the bass isolators come with music to calm the nerves during the earth. So on the left is a conventional building in an earthquake. On the right is a base isolated building. Now I know it's more exciting to be in the one on the left but you might get a heart attack. So it's better to be in the one on the right. The building on the right would be economical in construction and it will be relatively undamaged by the earthquake. But to do this, we need better knowledge of dynamics. Another way of dealing with earthquakes, requiring a better knowledge of dynamics, is to put in energy dissipation devices in the superstructure. And these energy dissipating devices, there are many different types. Elastic plastic dampers, load limiting devices, shock transmitters, viscoelastic dampers, and viscous dampers. And this is how the viscous dampers work. So the civil engineers need to collaborate with our mechanical engineers if we're to save our buildings in earthquakes. <clears throat> There's a proliferation of ground mounted PV systems in the Caribbean. We are expecting a significant amount of ground mounted PV.
TV systems in Barbados in the next decade. What is not commonly recognized and what is not commonly done is it is the that the design of ground mounted as distinct from roof mounted, the design of ground mounted TV systems involves structures which have a low natural frequency. And because they have low natural frequencies, they cannot safely be analyzed using pseudo static wind forces. Was the dynamic response would act would exaggerate the pseudostatic wind forces, and a lot of the losses of PV systems, which have occurred already due, due to high winds, are because the structures are not designed for dynamic action. And with, if they're low frequency, low lateral frequency, they need to be designed for dynamic action. So I've spoke, hopefully, I've spoken enough about the need for dynamics as a major component of our undergraduate courses at our universities. <clears throat> and then we graduate. When we graduate, when we have completed our academic studies, the graduate goes on to develop while working at their first jobs, getting the hands-on experience that cannot be learned in the classroom. The graduate can also take on further studies and training to keep up to date with modern technology and the ways of working. And this should be supported by the National Engineering Associations. So the first step is to establish that you have the right academic foundation. The second step, the route to professional qualification is through what can be called initial professional development. And from my point of view, the final step is a professional review consisting of an examination and an interview, which together form the assessments of knowledge and professional competence. At the moment, I think that our registration processes and the processes for becoming a corporate member of our national engineering associations is not sufficiently stringent, not sufficiently rigorous, if we are talking about creating professional engineers. So what is initial professional development? It provides a record of your working life that demonstrates that you have acquired the experience, knowledge and skills that are needed to practice as a professional engineer. The objectives include an appreciation of the subject and its integration with other subjects, knowledge to have an understanding of the subject and its application, and experience and ability to be able to perform independently or under supervision. Also, the IPD, Initial Professional Development Requirements, include the provision of a portfolio of your work, a professional review interview, and at least four years workplace experience. You can now be registered as a professional engineer in Jamaica with only two years workplace experience. Is that enough? Corporate membership and legal registration both require more or less the same standards. So after gaining enough skills and experience, the graduate can apply for corporate, and that is professionally qualified membership of the National Engineering Association and legal registration where this exists. These are the signs of professional and technical excellence and the keys to unlocking 
a world of job opportunities. Let me end by a couple of things. Ideally, there should be an overlapping of the words work of politicians and the work of engineers. Politics and engineering should overlap because they're both supposed to be ensuring the safety and welfare of society. And here's an interesting one. Here's the good news. Engineers are trusted. The trust in professions worldwide would have at the top, firefighters, nurses, teachers, and farmers. Engineers are pretty close to the top. But look at who is underneath the engineers. And look at who is at the bottom. I think I can end here. Thank you very much for listening to me. Okay, thank you very much, Engineer Gibbs, for a quite interesting and intriguing presentation. We now would invite Mr. Fazer Khan to um, make some comments. I will give Mr. Khan his introduction. Mr. Fazir Khan is the Managing Director of Alpha Engineering and Design 2020-12 Limited. He has over 30 years of experience as a practicing professional civil engineer and project manager working locally and within the Caribbean basin. Fazir graduated from the University of the West Indies, Trinidad, with a Bachelor of Science degree honors in civil engineering. He has obtained a diploma in management from Henley University in the United Kingdom and uh, certificates in project management from the Arthur Lockjack Graduate School. Fazer is a certified modeler for detention pond systems, urban storm water management, and hydrological modeling for sustainable solutions on large sites. He has a certificate in integrated coastal zone management from IHE Delft University. Apart from the Association of Professional Engineers of Trinidad and Tobago, APETT, where he was a past president between 2016 and 2017, he is also a registered member of the Board of Engineering of Trinidad and Tobago at the British Hydrological Society, England. He served as the APETT representative on the Joint Council for the Construction Industry from 2017 to 2018 before becoming the current president. Mr. Khan, I turn it over to you, sir. Good evening, everyone. Are you all hearing me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Okay, first, I'd, I'd like to thank Tony again for, for that presentation on behalf of everybody, I think. Um, and I would also like to inform all present that uh, Tony has recently been elevated to chair of the Industry Liaison Committee at the UWI. And it is my pleasure to, to be a member of that committee together with him. So getting straight into some comments, I'll be brief. Um, it, it is really um, shocking to, to, to hear about remedial maths and, and uh, four standard of English. And I, one of the things that um, I say frequently to my young engineers is essentially that engineering is the mathematical modeling of the real world to predict outcomes. And there's a reason that I repeat this to, to young engineers because I need them to understand that their basic root is in mathematics and to some extent physics. And there, there is some prodding on, 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 on my part and I'm, I'm sure uh, everyone that, is, that has to people like young engineers just to 
to figure out how how I get there at at, at, the, at, at max. Because if that is shaky, then unless they intend to be what we call an amateur engineer, and we're gonna have a really hard time in this profession. So I want to reinforce that we need to get to the bottom of of of, of why it is engineers are supposed to have advanced mathematics skills. Um, are performing poorly at maths. There is no way that they can get into the, the, the mathematical modeling with respect to dynamics in any of the sub-disciplines with, without a good understanding and, and, and liking for, math, for maths. So, and, and the latter is very important as well. I've had, I've had some engineers Actually, when I when I, I do some guest lectures lectures at the clinical campus, and I usually ask some questions along those lines. And when I ask, I I ask who, which which students like mathematics and which students like physics, and surprisingly, I get um, sometimes a large percentage or a, a, a shocking percentage of students who are engineers who don't want or do not like mathematics. And I think this is something that they need to understand coming into this profession, that it, it, it is based on mathematics. And as Colonel Brown said, um, the more complex our world, the more complex um, the problems, and hence the more complex we need to model those problems in a mathematical framework in order for us to do a good job at predicting outcomes. Now, so we spoke a lot about um, the, the various forces that we have to deal with here in the Caribbean, and we went through some examples with respect to with, with engineering, etc. Um, I just want to to touch on one one of those points, which is in terms of rainfall. Yes, we I do agree with it, and he knows a lot about the details of it. That many of the Caribbean countries do not have IDF tools or enough enough data to, to generate um, reliable IDF tools. So um, I could suggest that in the absence of such data. Um, people can take a look at the, the NOAA publication of the USDI and Puerto Rico maps. And when you, when you look at it, you'll see that those two islands have a, a, a very large number of agent stations, both rainfall and state and the data collection is enormous compared to any island in the Southern Caribbean, including Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago will say that we have a fair amount of gauging, but when you look at the details of the data, there are a lot of gaps. And this is not good for statistical analysis. So the, the actual statistical analysis found in the NOAA are basically a, a repeat of what they have been doing in the States for in North America for a long time, uh, it, it's, it's very, very rigorous. So, and since we are usually designing, unless we're dealing with um, with real hydrology, if we're dealing with, it, with, with, with floods and high intensity um, runoff, so the, the curves that, that, that can apply in the absence of anything else or guessing, um, you can you can find some correlation in the USDI class for the so, so. so now that said there is a there is a reason why we, we, we when I went to school um, I did a degree in civil engineering and now in the last couple of years the degree has become civil and environmental engineering. There's a reason for that. And again 
and Janet gives gave the reason for that because more and more we have now to deal with the environmental problem or some environmental problem as civil engineers and without wanting to rehash it um there is a there is no a lot of intersection between environmental engineering and civil engineering and one has to i had to go back to my books to learn some biology and chemistry as one can imagine that these um these are, this information and knowledge is required and when when one gets into sustainable urban drainage designs or low impact development principles so from a now we recently did a, a, a project in St. Lucia where we had to, to, to procure and install gauging stations in, in a couple of catchments uh, in order to, 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 to treat the uh, flood mitigation uh, problem. And even in a couple of years, in two years, the one can can glean a lot of information from from this data and the the, the technology is, is is very good now where where you these, these things are all scattered uh connected so that you can sit at your computer and get pretty much live data and then it's a matter of the analysis after that and one does not need if, if one is interested in hydrology, and the reason I'm talking about it because it's, it, it is because I know that there, there is less of an interest um, in, in, in with Caribbean engineers for, for that speciality of hydrology and hydraulics, which, which I got into. And I will say to you all out there as a commercial thing, it's, there's a market for it. And that that market usually was um, it was filled by expatriates. So when when the big jobs that came out for um, riverine flood controls and um, essentially large hydrological studies, etc., you'll find you'll find that the bigger European and some North American and Canadian firms will will be successful. So um, this 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 I think has to change, and um, I would encourage the younger one um, to, to in this forum here to 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 take, to take up that challenge. Now there is something else that I, I I tell some I used to say to young engineers, and I think it it, it is a bit. Um, maybe dated now, but we, we cannot afford to be specialists like in the in the first world country. So you find a guy, a guy that would have designed bridges in the States, but he may be a specialist in the in the um in the apartment design. And another and another guy does the, the beams, pre stress beams. He's not even going to do for you um structural steel for instance. So in in in, in as Caribbean engineers we find so again to echo to me we, we find that we have to not be a jack of all trades but but actually have the a, a skill a multi -dis, sub disciplinary skill set uh otherwise to put it bluntly we start so especially in the in, in, in private enterprise where where a consultant company for instance like mine um really needs to have a Broad base in order to, to survive in the open market. Uh, okay, so let me move on to professional development. I think um, that that the point is worth making again that the national associations really need to push the government for the the laws that are required for professional engineers to exist within law and then also 
for for professional development programs to to be computerized within that that ambit. By that I mean, uh, if you're a professional engineer in in a first world country, to keep your professional status, you have to do a certain amount of professional development, get a certain amount of units every year, simply so that you keep up to date and and courses and attending sessions like this gives you that opportunity among other things. Right now, um, I am I know for sure in Trinidad and most of the the islands, it's it's not like that, and that that needs to change and it needs to change quickly. There is something else that I think um, people that are in some some position of influence um, can can pursue, which is at a at a, at a government level. There should be some sort of incentive for companies that, in order to take on graduates and interns, sometimes these these institutions can assist getting graduates and students um, into the workplace into these programs. But again, private companies operating a business. No one is asking for a handout. Are we talking about tax breaks, 50%, like whatever it is. Um, but I think um, people can should, should approach the the governments with around the time when it's um, budget. You know, so 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 see if that those 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 kind of those measures cannot be put in place. The the other thing I'd, I'd I touch on in terms of the initial professional development is I've had the pleasure of working with the UE at St. Augustine Civil and Environmental uh, Department where we would take on two or three of interns in year two. Now we have still have a three year program, so it's in year two. And it was pretty structured in that they, they, they had steps to follow. So this is what uh, one of the things that Tony was talking about in terms of getting getting a documentation on. Now, we where we need to go from there is when we take on graduates for so them to continue that kind of documentation in order in on the road to professional status. And that I'll, I'll end my comment there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Khan. All right, I will add Engineer Gibbs, um, Lieutenant Colonel Brown, and Mr. Khan, just to bring up your videos as we're going to go into the question and answer segment of tonight's um, session. Um, I would ask our guests, and first I want to extend um, greetings to our regional guests. Um, Stacy has indicated to me that she's recognized about 12 persons um, who are our regional guests, um, Lester Arnold, Marissa Noel, Omar Bisfat, um, Rami Shia, Reyes Kudrath, forgive me if I'm struggling with some of these names, uh, Winston Mellows, Winston Chatterton, Wilfred Carrero, Lester Arnold, um, Josine Gerwu, Edbert Louis, and Ambrose Tillett. We'd like to um, thank all of you for joining us this evening as we continue to try to- You mentioned Judith Harvey? Um, no, I didn't, but that name was a picked up. So Judith Harvey as well, welcome. And we really want to thank you all for joining with us this evening as we reach across the region to try to create linkages and certainly do our networking so that we can get to know each other throughout this region more and more. And it's through initiatives and events like this that we can get to know each other. Um, the Caribbean certainly is, uh, we may be divided by water, but with the technology that we have today, there's no need for us to remain divided anymore. So we need to really get to know each other throughout the various organizations. And more and more, we hope to, to get to know you, uh, get to know the faces and 
one day we may even get to meet in person, some of us. So fantastic. Thank you for joining us. So this evening, we want to invite you to engage uh, with our panelists, um, Engineer Gibbs, Engineer Can, and Engineer um, Lieutenant Colonel Brown in his capacity as the head of the Council of Caribbean Engineering Organizations. I would ask that you either um, raise your hand, show the raise hand um, feature so that we will know that we can call upon you. You can ask your question in person, or if you're feeling a little shy or your connection is not the best, we'd ask that you put your question into the chat and I can read the question out to the person or persons that you wish to direct your question in toward. So the floor is open uh, for persons to ask some questions. I will ask you not to be shy. Um, we are here to learn from each other. And this is a golden opportunity to engage the minds of engineers Gibbs, Brown, and Can on the topic of the um, reform or rather Caribbean engineering reform from student selection to professional registration. I'm also happy to see that we have a uh, guidance counselor in our mix this evening. And obviously this is somebody that is an important aspect of this whole process in guiding students to taking up um, engineering profession. So Kim, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us this evening. Our first question is from Winston Mellows and it says, how does safety and loss prevention fit into the training of scenario uh, in this training scenario of engineers? How does safety and loss prevention fit into the training scenario of engineers? Engineer Gibbs, you want to start with that one? Well, I would have thought almost every aspect of civil engineering education and post-graduation training involves the, the, the need to produce safe environments for the public. And the, the, the main justification for registration of engineers is to protect the public. And part of the protection of the public would be to make sure that they're safe when they use man-made um, engineer made uh, um, facilities so it's uh, it's hard to it's hard to separate safety from the engineering profession as far as I, um, as far as i'm concerned okay engineer can your response uh, yes i agree with all of that and um, i also want to add that in the last 10 to 15 years with the advent of OSHA in most countries um, that, that this, these aspects of our practice, especially on sites, I'm not moving away from it from, from what we describe as essentially having to comply for design. Um, the, the actual practice on sites is, is, is now subject to OSHA law. Um, Engineer Brown, I'm asking you to take this question from an electrical standpoint. What would be your comments? Oh, no, I, I agree completely. I, I think the point that Professor Mellows is making is, is the extent to which safety and loss prevention is actually central to engineering, and not, not only um, in the sense of protecting the public either, but it protecting the general societal interests. And, and, and I, I actually think it is what engineering is all about. So I, I fully endorse the, the response from from. And Fazir and, and, and Engineer Gibbs. The, I have a question that I wanted to ask if, if, I, if I'm allowed to do that. Of course, I, I was very impressed. I was very impressed with um, the, the comment that, that Fazir made about the, the need for CP to continue professional development. I was wondering, and, and I, I, I must say that I'm, I'm very thankful for the, to, to find out about the role of the, of the um, industry liaison committee and the work that they're actually doing. But the, my question is is this committee? almost exclusively focused on turning on the, the actual current students? Or are you also interested in the practicing engineers who will be practicing for the next 10, 20, 30 years and who need also to adjust to some of the realities that you have outlined? So, I mean, the truth is we don't have the time or the, or the, 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 the luxury 
of actually waiting for these newly trained engineers who understand the new realities to come into, to come into the practice. The reality is that we do have a number of, um, I don't want to say relics, but people who have been out there for many, many years under the old system who actually have to practice in the new, in the new system. Does the liaison committee also include that aspect of, of training reform? No. The, the terms of reference of the Industry Liaison Committee is limited to, uh, to, to what takes place at the University of the West Indies, in our case, Civil Engineering Department, and does not, it does not extend, of course, it, the, the way it, 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 um, it relates to what happens after university is a recognition that, that the university can't do everything. And the university has to decide what the university needs to do and what to hand over, what, what's, what, what, um, what role the university needs to hand over to the professional engineering associations, national associations and employers. And the, the real problem in the Caribbean, and it's a, it's a problem which doesn't get better, is that we have a proliferation of small companies. And small companies have difficulty in training graduates and in absorbing interns. And, you know, there was a, a study done of the consulting engineering profession in, the Car in Barbados about 20, 25 years ago by a, a master's student from the University of Western Ontario. And he listed at that time, about 25 years ago, 19 consulting firms offering services in civil and structural engineering in Barbados, 19. Well, the Barbados community would be much better served if they had six firms Six firms still provides you with competition. And each of those six firms be three times the size of the current, of the then 19 firms. So somehow or the other, we have to get over this idea that everybody wants to be their own boss and find some way of encouraging, and maybe the government can, can, can have a role in this, encouraging the, the, the amalgamation of small firms into larger firms. Okay, uh, we have some questions coming in. I see your hand, um, Justin Leslie, I'll just ask you to hold a minute. I have a question from Judith Harvey, and this one is for Engineer Khan. Um, the question is, is there feasible scope for research and data collection toward development of IDF curves for each island or for groups of islands? Yes, um, that is a, a very good question. And um, there will always be the need for, for island specific data. And I think when we put all of this data together at, at a regional level, then we have more data. And we, as I was saying before, the statistical results will usually be better. But it depends on like, okay, so just to repeat, the collected or stream flow and rainfall data is, is, is not just about dealing with high intensity rainfall and designing for that. As engineers, we are also involved in yield hydrology, uh, where we would like to understand how, how a dam will fill up yeah, pan evaporation and what what do we need to do in order to to, 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 to satisfy a demand for potable water by processing water from a river um also now we we find ourselves tied to designing um systems low impact development systems sustainable cities etc whereby we have to 
to tie in uh, water and water bodies. And like to do that, and also like grass swales and all of those things, to do that, we need to understand the hydrology, the pre-development hydrology and the post-development hydrology. And a simple definition of low impact development will be to try to match the pre-development hydrology in the post-development uh, world. And there are different techniques to do that. In order to, 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 to address that as an engineer, um, to operate from a, a position of, of, of data, one, one must have um, certain data with respect to evaporation, fan evaporation, wind speed, um, coverage, and all the other things that are, that are associated with, with how we, we deal with um, hydrological modeling. Hope that answers the question. Okay, thank you very much, Engineer Khan. Um, Mr. Leslie, I would ask that you unmute and ask your question to the panel. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, right. What I'd like to share and possibly um, can form as a question in terms of developing the Caribbean engineers. Um, what about the setting up of training courses? Um, in the different areas, because apparently the other different islands have experienced different types of um, forces, and it could also be a way of developing the skill set of young engineers graduating from university and offer it online where everyone will be able to access it and benefit. Thank you. So Engineer Gibbs, uh, give you the opportunity to take a stab at this along with Engineer Khan, since you're both uh, members um, on the uh, UE St. Augustine. Um, so you want to offer some comment there? Uh, is, is, is Justin, are you talking about courses after graduation or courses as part of the undergraduate course uh, program? I'm, I'm talking about uh, courses post-grad as for part of um, continuous professional development. Yes, okay. Well, th this, uh, I would think that this is mainly uh, the, the role of the national engineering associations to put on those courses. Um, Trevor? Um, yes, it probably would be Tony, and, and it actually takes your the, the idea that you that you developed just now of of the problem we have of the large number of smaller firms in Barbados, and it, what he's he's actually developing that now to, to, to the regional level, where even within the region, within the different islands, it could be possible to develop expertise to levels such that that engineers are far more rounded from a, from a global competitiveness point of view. And, and, and actually, in part of your presentation, you spoke about the need for us to become globally competitive and to be actually be world leaders in engineering because of the peculiar challenges that our engineers face in this region. And what he's saying actually builds on that. I, I, I actually agree. The challenge, of course, is how you actually do it. Um, I mean, the truth is just to get the, the continuing professional development going has been a challenge. This, there's about five years now that we've actively been promoting CPD. It is going now, but to be quite honest, it is, it is, it it is voluntary. I, I think as um, Fazir said, what we really need is for government to understand the value of engineering to national development and to actually put some structures in place to build the strength of engineering and the role that engineers play in solving problems in this extremely complicated world in which we live. Fazit spoke about the need, for example, for engineers to, to be comfortable and happy with maths. The truth is, unless you do that, you're not, you're not going to be able to touch the kind of complex problems that we're facing in this world now. So I, 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 I do in, in endorse Justin's suggestion that if, even beyond the, the, the rounded in island training we're talking about, that we need to move to the stage where a, a, a top engineer in this region is as comfortable in Trinidad as he is in St. Lucia, 
as it is in Jamaica. And, and, and we, but the structures to get to that is what we have, we, we, have to, we have to move towards that. But we're nowhere near that as we speak. Thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Brown. Now, I want to drill down a little bit. Um, we, had, we said that this, this um, discussion this evening from student selection to professional registration. And we've spoken quite a bit on the professional registration side. Now, I have in our audience, as I said, uh, an active um, student council, um, sorry, a, a school counselor in our, in our midst. Um, Kim, I will just ask you to unmute for a moment, um, just to join this part of the conversation if you're there. Kim, you're there? Yes, please. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Now, Kim, it was mentioned earlier that we are having challenges when students come through the secondary school system and uh, having done a level or CAPE and they reach the university level and they're having to do remedial mathematics and they're having to do remedial English. As a teacher, can you offer a perspective as what is happening at the secondary school level that is causing us to, when, when students get to the um, university level that we are having these challenges in the Caribbean at present. Would you like to offer some comment on that from your perspective, please? Okay, thank you. Um, I thought it was an interesting comment when I heard it and I was a bit saddened by it because it means that we are working hard on our end and not fulfilling the roles that are required on the other end. And that students, even though that they would have put in the work and done their very best to get um, the top grades because it's only at a certain level that you'll be accepted to do certain engineering programs um, at best that they would have received their top goals and the top grades and those goals and grades are not um, what is required what is accepted and still has to be um, so I'm not sure if the disconnect would necessarily be with the students per se or in the information that is shared and not necessarily from the teacher's perspective either because teachers will be carrying out the instructions based on the curriculum that is, is set. So I think that some conversation needs to be had between the examining bodies and the um, institutions for which they need to be uh, qualified to, to gain. Additionally, I remember several years ago that um, the Barbados Community College would have implemented a, a program where students who would have completed their uh, fundamental courses being mathematics and sometimes English, but mostly mathematics, they would have implemented a course where students had to complete this program. Um, I'm not employed there, so I'm going on strictly my memory, where they had to do when they completed their CSET courses, uh, mathematics in fourth form, because students are allowed to do CSET mathematics in fourth form. But if we are having a disconnect at the O level and the A level, which is K um, level, then the conversation needs to be had beyond the students um, because they would have done their very best. They would have gained acceptance and then to find that they have not yet reached the mark that is um, required of them. So are we saying then that our current curriculum is out of sync with the requirements of university matriculation, not only in the Caribbean, but I'm going to assume further afield. Is that the general um, idea? Well, I, I am not qualified to say yes, and I'm not um, in a position where I can uh, favorably say absolutely because I am not in the classroom, the academic level of that sort. Um, but if it is that the students are getting to a stage where they are being accepted and then they are found to, the information is found wanting, then there is some, some measure, something has to be fixed at the level between the curriculum being taught and what is required. So there either needs to be an introduction course which will bring students who may have done it years prior at the university level to make sure that they all start on the same playing field when they enter, or I, cause I'm not sure that the curriculum at the CSET or K level will be able to take any other loads given to, to students. Far reaching in my world imagination, if there were certain mathematical courses that were taught for the persons who are going on to the engineering stream so that you would have different levels of math at a diff at the CAPE level, maybe that would be something that could be implemented. So you'd have um, students doing CAPE math for engineering or CAPE and a particular kind of engineering because you would focus on that. Um, I cannot 
participate in that because mathematics, I'm sorry, sirs, it's not my friend. We have had uh, interaction in my younger days and we've realized that our relationship is best left um, away. So I applaud those who can, but for students who are desperate to go in that direction, maybe the mathematical streams and streams could be created in such a way that the focus from early is on a particular stream so that the curriculum is guided in that way so that the students can get where they want to go and be qualified when they get there. Thank you so much for that intervention, Ms. Lynch. Um, Fazir, can I ask you if in Trinidad you are having a similar scenario playing out in terms of our students transitioning from the secondary level to the university level? Is that what you're also seeing in Trinidad? Well, I think um, when, when Tony made the observation, I think he, he made the observation throughout. And my my own experience, and I'm not, not in an academician, um, is that I think it's a, it could be an attitude problem that starts at what we call the SEA level, where, where, where children are given problems and then given solutions. And it, it's so, so they, there's a certain amount of critical thinking that I think um one should start to embrace at, at a levels if not at all levels um and the last speaker there to, to from from my memory in when i when i did a levels math mathematics was um applied math or pure math so you, you see the difference there because um, engineering is basically the application of maths, so so there should be a natural stream in there. Um, but I, but I think the, because of the the high focus that we, we we place in this part of the world on on getting those A's and ten subjects and and, and all ones or whatever it is, um, we 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 find that I find my my observation is that, that students tend to lack some critical thinking but and it can be developed once they have the right attitude even after university or during university you'll see the ones the ones that, that really love what they're doing will always tend to apply themselves differently so i don't think it's a it's a it's a, it's a carte blanche rule that we could apply here engineer gibbs you care to offer some comment on based on the information you would have heard just now Well, of course, I'm a long distance away from my school days. Um, but the what the I would just share with you something which happened. We, we had a meeting at St. Augustine. I don't know, Fazi, you, you might have been present. It was a meeting of the industry liaison committee with the the the, the new head of of the civil engineering depart department. Um, and one of the things that they mentioned was that for KIP, for the A-levels A mathematics, that some of the schools are literally teaching, or that the students at A-levels are, are learning, learning the solutions to 60 questions. They're learning the solutions to 60 mathematics questions on the assumption that they would get enough of those questions in the exam that they could do well in the exam. I mean, I found this, I was, I found this almost unbelievable that you were doing mathematics at A levels and you're learning the solutions to specific questions. This is what we were told. And th this, this must be a problem which has to be addressed by CXC, by, by CXC and by the schools themselves, by minist ministries of education. Ms. Lynch, can I engage you one more time? Certainly. 
are we then saying that at the secondary level regionally that we are more focused as engineer Khan would have mentioned on students attaining ones and is as opposed to really concentrating and digging into content to make sure that they understand what it is that they're learning um this platform here has a multitude of persons from across the caribbean and they would have a variety of under experiences and different approaches to how they deal with different things my my perspective will be limited in that my exposure to such will be not to the same degree my general observation would just be that there are, are lots of things required to be taught within a short space of time um newspapers and the media um ministries for the politicians everybody um, promotes, accepts, celebrates those who uh, gain the extreme passes. How they got to that level, they don't necessarily investigate or they don't um, question. So persons look at what will be considered the bottom line. It is not hard to imagine that this would be the case, that persons would try to have rote memorization to produce the results that they require and gain as many passes as they would want to get because that is how you get to the next level and maybe they hope that it will um you know smooth out even out um but there are lots of things required in the short space of time that students are exposed to and expected to gain passes in so maybe that could be a a, a part of it that could be a contributing factor but again, my experience is limited and my opinion, my, my thoughts are from where they come, may not represent properly the body represented here in the audience. Thank you, Ms. Lynch. And I think that you will find that your comments probably do represent regionally a reality that we all do face. And I'm gonna ask um, Lieutenant Colonel Brown to offer some insight into this topic. Yeah, thanks, Vincent. I, only to agree completely with the guidance counselor. The truth is, I think she she put her finger exactly on the problem. Even when Tony first mentioned it, it, it crossed my mind that the truth is, our A-level system is not designed to produce candidates for engineering. I mean, it, it is not it is not designed, it is not run, it is not operated, and the results don't reflect but turning out students who are excellent, who, who are prepared in maths and physics and, and the sciences for engineering. It is actually geared to produce large numbers of successful passes. And, and, and for many students, the way to pass is not necessary to understand, but to be ready for whatever questions come and to get the right answers done. And therefore, it, it is a case of conflicting systems. I think that that problem has to be solved by UE, by in the first, maybe in a pre-year or in the very first year, to have some kind of half course or something that actually prepare the student for the kind of mathematics that they will have to face in the real world of engineering of the 21st century. But, but I don't think it is reasonable to expect that the, the education system that we currently have is going to produce engineer-ready first-year students. And I, I think that's just the reality. But I, I understand the, the concern that that was raised, but the reality is, and I, I think um, Kim, Mitch, Aline explained it perfectly. The system does what the system is designed to do. And, and to some extent they do it well, but that does not include preparing mathematics and physics students for engineering. Yes, as a I, general- I one, of, one, of problems we have is, one of the problems we have is to raise the level of consciousness among the really bright students that we have, the political people and the people in education of the critical role of engineering. We really need to channel the really bright students in this region into engineering because engineering is what saw the wealth of a community is created by innovation, investment, by development. This, this is engineering. That is how you build wealth. Instead, what we are seeing is a situation where we are being led by, by, by borrowing and loans and, and dependency. 
But that, that does not build well. And we need to get the society, the leadership, and the young, bright students to understand that wealth comes from development, from innovation, from creativity. And that is where engineering lies. So the, the naturally bright students that really do enjoy maths and that actually and love the problem solving aspect of it, which is what we really want, that those students will be attracted to become engineers and I don't, I, I, rather than lawyers, for example, or rather than economists or other social, the other glamorous things. Tony explained the problem. When he put up the list of highly paid jobs, he only had them engineers. But if he put some of the other jobs that you would see why people may not be so interested in maths or physics because they are maybe on, on becoming some politician. And, and they, you don't need maths for that. They, apparently, they don't add a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Engineer Gibbs, you're going to offer a comment just now. I've forgotten what you, I've forgotten what it was that I was going to say. Um, but the, <clears throat> there is this, the, the, going beyond the, the school, the school um, uh, experience into the university experience. When I speak to graduates from UWI, they complain quite a lot about the, the amount of work they're expected to do in the three years they now have. And they're, 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 there isn't the time to absorb the information and to really understand the fundamentals. There's, there's, there's a need because of the system to pass the exams, to get good grades. And that means me, that causes a lot of, to use a crude term, cramming um, as a thing from absorbing and understanding. And of course, this is quite contrary to what we need in engineering. You need people to understand the fundamentals very thoroughly so that they can use the information, the fundamentals to solve problems which are not problems which they were taught to solve, problems which they've never seen before, which can be solved using the fundamental science and technology which they get at university. Thank you very much, Engineer Gibbs. I'm aware that we are 10 minutes over and I would ask our panelists indulgence for another 10 minutes. Um, Engineer Gibbs, uh, sorry, Engineer Brown, I'm gonna ask you a very unfair question. Uh, we've heard of the importance this evening of uh, rationalizing registration systems literally across the region. Uh, we've heard of the importance of pushing our university education to a level where it is um, where it meets this region's needs. And at, at, at this point in time, it seems to be somewhat failing in that regard. How is the, the regional body um, seeking or what are the ideas of the regional body to lobby or, or um, various jurisdictions in terms of governments, et cetera, to implement and make the realistic changes that need to be made to really push the engineering profession forward in this region? Well, that's not an unfair question. That's a, that's a reasonable question. And in fact, um, this has been high, this is, is now high on the, the priority list for, for CCO. And in fact, over the last couple of months, we, we've been lobbying to get into positions to do this. I, I don't know, I assume that most engineers are aware of this, but. The, at the regional level, governments are actively in the process of negotiating an exchange services, a, a exchange between the e European Union and this region for services. Now, what that is, can possibly mean is a situation where engin professional engineers from the European Union negotiate access into this region for engineering services. Unless we get our act together, and standardize red, things like how we, who, who is red, uh, Tony mentioned himself in his presentation, the discrepancy between registration standards in different, in different islands in this Caribbean. But when the, the, the CARICOM region negotiate a, 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 a treaty or a memorandum of understanding with the EU, 
the EU, they, they will come down as a collective group with a collective understanding and with a collective approach to what they want to do in this region. And if we are not careful and not prepared, we will come up with the short end of the state. So we, we do need to get our act together, but we, we, we have been working on it. We've been trying to, we, 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 we know on a number of regional committees and regional boards, but it is actually a long road. And, and the real challenge is for engineers themselves to understand the critical role that we need to play if there's going to be any level of success in this region, indeed in the world, but, but then we have to make some changes and we've, we've discussed some of the changes that will have to be implemented if there's going to be any level of success. Once people recognize the importance and the value of engineering, it becomes a lot easier for us to get to lobby government to do a number of the things that need to be done in terms of um, in, encouraging the really bright students into engineering, in, in terms of supporting the university with, with the development programs and all that, and in terms of things like registration and even like continuing professional development. I, I hasten to say that much as I respect the work being done by the liaison committee for the next, for the engineers who will be with us in the next five, 10, 15 years, I fear that we need to make changes for those engineers who are here today and who will be doing engineering tomorrow and next week, because the world is not going to wait until the newly trained young engineers come on stream. We, the exit, well, I'm retired now, but the, 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 the active engineers have to, we have to change to reflect the realities of the time. So it is a big job, it's not an unfair question, and it's precisely what CCEO is all about and, and what we've been trying to do. And, and sessions like this, of course, help us to, 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 to channel that, which is why I really would like in my closing comments to say how much I appreciate. Um, I didn't realize that Tony was the chairman of the, of the committee, and Fazia explained that, but that whole committee for the for, for including CCO in their discussions and giving us the opportunity to share some of their concerns with the region. And maybe, maybe this could be the beginning of the kind of discussions that help us all to recognize the role that we must play if there's gonna be any level of success and wealth building in this region. Uh, Thank you very much for that. Yes, sir. Vincent, I'd like to uh, please, please invite the person in the, in the, in the audience who is from the Caribbean Development Bank to say what it is, how it is that the Caribbean Development Bank can contribute to what we are, we are talking about, about, the, about the, contribute to the development of the engineering profession. And Engineer Ashby, would you care to share, sir? Is Engineer Ashby there? I saw he was there. Yes, he might have stepped away for a moment. So while, while we wait on William to come back, um, I have a question from uh, Ms. Lynch. Um, go ahead, Kim. Yes, please. Um, the suggestion that was made earlier by Mr. Gibbs prompted me to wonder, I'm not sure if there is a relationship between the universities that offer the engineering degrees and the businesses that are engineer engineering companies, if there is like a co-op, I know that co-op, the co-op term um, is used in Canada where students are working. It's not necessarily an internship, but they're working in certain areas that will gain, they will gain the work experience. So the, if the point that you raised, sir, about students not being able to absorb the information, I think it could also be a part that they are not getting a chance to practice it before they are tossed out into the world after they've su successfully Cross the stage to collect their certificate. Um, so I'm thinking that the businesses can have an organize an agreement, so to speak, with the university. I don't know if it already exists. This is just a, a question suggestion that they employ, um, and I use the term employ um, carefully, students who are maybe second year of their program, they would have gone through certain fundamentals, certain uh, foundation courses, and that they'd be employed in certain aspects. And maybe they have to um, complete a certain amount of hours in this area, a certain amount of hours in this area, so that they can put what they have been learning into actual practical use. I know that there's certain, there's a certain um, universities in Canada been having conversations with them about certain things, not particularly engineering, but just the students in general, where they have as part of their four-year program, a co-op 
system where it takes the students into like a five-year degree program. It's all part of their degree program. So you're almost more qualified having had the um, work experience and the connection with the, the employer along with your university degree at the end. So I'm thinking that, that can strengthen the, not only the knowledge base of the, the students, but the profession in general, because you would have gotten students who would have been trained on the job through while they were gaining academic in, information as well. Thank you. So be before Engineer Gibbs responds, and, and I believe Engineer Khan had mentioned something about possibility of governments having a subvention of some type to assist firms in the various um, locales to be able to do something similar. I guess it would be like a work attachment. I also remember that um, the universities in the United Kingdom, they used to have um, a four-year program where one of the years was um, work study type attachment. So when you get into industry, you're, you're literally hit the ground running. So I think those are all very valid um, comments to be made. Um, Engineer Gibbs, from your point of view, what would you like to, to reply? Well, what, is, what happens now is that many of the students do get um, uh, holiday placements long, uh, the, during their long, their long holidays, placements with companies. Uh, these, 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 these last for the, for the length of the, of, the, of the holiday. But then I'm not aware of any sandwich courses in the Caribbean where there is a formal arrangement between companies and the university where the student studies at the university and then takes a year off to, to, to do practical, uh, practical um, training with a company before going back to the university to complete the academic course. I'm not, I'm not aware of that, but they do, the students do get placements with companies during the, during the vacations. But let me say one more thing. There, there is quite a, a, a debate which continues as to whether a graduate, whether, whether companies want graduates who, to use the phrase that I've heard said, hit the ground running, and graduates who do not necessarily hit the ground run, running. I am of the view that what we need are in, in, in the firms that, which, I, which I've been involved in is a, a graduate who is very soundly grounded in the fundamentals, and we will do the training on the job. So we want the graduate to be educated, not trained, and we do the training. Engineer Gibbs, are we then not saying, I mean, you, you alluded to earlier the fact that a study was undertaken 25 years ago in Barbados, which indicated that there were approximately 19 practices for engineering in Barbados. That um, probably works well for a firm, but if you have a one-man shop, how effective is that necessarily going to happen? Can't. It can't happen. But the society encourages one-man shops. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the and the the put it this way, there's that's that's the way we seem to be built. That we are we all want we have we have an individual an individualist bent uh, 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 among us, which says we, each of us wants to be our own boss. Okay, very and quickly. That's, that's, that right. situation will not produce um, excellence. Okay, very quickly, Engineer Khan, um, you you are in Trinidad. Can you tell us if the, the petrochemical industries, um, that aspect of engineering, do they have um, a more integrative approach to students coming out of university in terms of offering any sandwich programs or um, more opportunity to have um, work experience, etc. Is that happening at present or has that been happening or can you give us some idea? Because obviously that industry has a bit more money than the other industries, so they can probably put a bit more into that aspect. Can you offer some comment there? Yeah, definitely. Um, the, the thing is they not only have more money, but they also 
um, have existed for a long time um, based on the um, on colonial intervention and then um, nationalization. Uh, so what has happened over the many years is that multitude of engineers have been trained. Now I myself benefited from working for five years with uh, with uh, the local oil company as a civil engineer. And um, it, it, it was amazing in that the, the remuneration that was offered was like twice what was what I was hired for in another private company. And that can be an attraction and it could be a good thing or a bad thing, especially for a civil engineer because civil engineering is not that um, it's not that detailed in, in, in an area like a uh, petrol, which is in the company. However, what has happened over the years is um, there was a large capacity developed, uh, technical capacity at the engineering level. And, and this, this, this strikes to the heart of the point that we need to think about global competitiveness. We, we Trinidad and the Bidou, can now say that we export our nationals um, in the oil industry all over the world. Uh, so we have a large contingent of people in Dubai and other areas like that in Nigeria. Wherever there is a, 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 an oil industry that is fairly young, um, you will find that, um, that, that our engineers and technicians, and I am talking um, not petroleum engineers, chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, and even civil engineers um, are there. And right now in Guyana, we have um, exported a lot of our um, technical help to that. So, so this, this is a good example for us to use to see that there is a potential if we, if we, if we really develop um, into niche um, categories that we, that, that, that we can find up at, at, at the countries um, to, to market that. Okay, thank you very much for that, Engineer Khan. All right, so I'm going to ask two, well, ask one question, and give Mr. Leslie opportunity to ask us, and then we're going to have closing comments. Um, there's a question in the chat from Mr. Egbert Lewis, and he said, how are we going to address the need to have um, reciprocal, right. how do we, sorry, how are we going to address the need to have reciprocity among engineering registration groups through the Caribbean. Shouldn't we develop a single body which would review qualifications and experience of engineering applicants? And unless a benchmark is met, that engineer would not enjoy reciprocity. Ah, this word is destroying me this evening. Reciprocity. Uh, you understand what I mean. Look at the word. <laughs> Forgive um, me. By the way, um, I wrote to a former chairman of CARICOM about this particular issue, about, about the free movement of engineers in the Caribbean. It's, um, and, and the, the problem with it is that um, at the moment, there, there are different standards. For example, I mentioned in my presentation a number of different engineering um, institutions in the Caribbean, from, from Guyana all the way up to Belize. And it is very unlikely that, that Guyana would not accept a degree from the University of Guyana as being a satisfactory academic qualification for registration in Guyana. And, you, and you can carry that, that argument all the way up from Guyana through Trinidad, uh, the Bahamas, to be across to Belize and Jamaica as well. So that's one of the problems. The problem, one of the problems is that the academic standards of the seven institutions, um, higher education institutions offering degrees in engineering in the Commonwealth Caribbean, those academic standards are not the same. The second problem is that the, the number of years of, of um, post-graduation training on the job uh, differ 
from, from one country to another. I mean, Jamaica requires two years, Barbados requires four years, for example. So you can be registered reg and re or registerable in Jamaica without being able to be registered in Barbados. When going back to the academic standards, the academic standards for registration in Trinidad are higher than they are in Barbados. In, in, in Barbados, we accept by law the, the a first degree from the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, as being an adequate academic standard for registration in Barbados. Trinidad does not. Trinidad says the first degree is not sufficient. They have to have further learning, which can be achieved by doing a, a, a master's degree at UWA. So that's the difference. I think that what we have to do is to adopt not the lowest common denominator, but the highest standard, which at the moment is registration in Trinidad and have that as being the least that we should be aiming at for the Caribbean. But in my presentation, I talked about the need to present a portfolio of your work, to be, sub be subjected to a, a professional interview and to do an examination. I think those things are necessary for registration. So if you, if you what you could do is to have a, a multi-tier system where there could be the highest tier, which is which if you get if you get through on the highest tier, then you can practice anywhere in the Caribbean. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Engineer Brown, you want to mention anything in that regard before we close up? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm on board. And, and the, the, the concept that Tony outlined is, is precisely what we're looking at as CEO. So we're on board with that kind of thinking. Fantastic. Okay, um, Mr. Leslie, you get to ask the last question for the evening, sir. Thank you. My question is, is there a code, engineering code in the Caribbean which um, deals with the design for, against um, hurricanes, whether it be standard hurricanes or major hurricanes? The answer is yes. Care to elaborate a bit more, Engineer Gibbs? <laughs> <laughs> well, Caribbean wide, there is something called the Caribbean Uniform Building Code. It's very, it's 36 years old. That doesn't mean it's a bad code. It's certainly a lot better than nothing. And in the one of the one of the documents in the Caribbean Uniform Building Code is a is a part two, section two, wind loads. And that when combined with the other sections of the code, which deal with how to design for timber, reinforced concrete, and for steel, you can produce a safe building. Even with the 36 year old code, you could produce a safe building if you use, if you use um, comprehensively the 1985 Caribbean Uniform Building Code. Of course, many of us are no longer simply limiting ourselves to that, and we use more modern standards. The, the, for, for, um, and, uh, and, and of course, there are several. They're, they're, the popular ones now are the, are the North American standards, as far as as far as hurricanes are concerned, the wind loads in the American Society of Civil Engineers standard number seven um, are becoming, that's becoming quite popular. And so that can be used. And what we do have, what we do have in the Caribbean are excellent, is excellent information on the hazard levels as far as hurricanes are concerned. We have the best people in the Americas who have worked on this subject consistently for several decades. And the most recent information 
on wind speeds for structural design through, uh, for the whole Caribbean basin, English, Dutch, French, and Spanish speaking, was published in 2019. All of the information is on the internet, freely available, and is state-of-the-art information. So that information is readily available for people who wish to use it. Thank you very much, Engineer Gids. And my takeaway word for tonight is reciprocity. Uh, thank you very much, um, Kim. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to give everybody an, a brief opportunity just to get some closing comments, and then we will close tonight's session. So I'll start with you, um, Engineer Khan. Um, yeah, so I'd like to thank uh, the chair and everyone else for having me um, here. It was very informative. Uh, but, and, to have 32 people at this time of the evening um, still hanging in there, that, that, that's good news. Um, yeah, it, it, it turned out of as well for our continuing the further discussion in, in, for the sake of engineering education. I, w I just want to so, put something out there, which is that notwithstanding what we do um, in the Caribbean, and in terms of the, the, the different islands, etc. The market, open market forces has a way of, of, of being the asset debt. So let me explain what I mean by that. If, if, if there is a CDB project or a World Bank project or a European funded project tomorrow and you put in a proposal for that project, essentially you have to submit for we're talking about consultancy here. You, you have to submit a CV um, for a specialist area, whether it's ideology, structure, whatever. And it, it, one does not look, I would think, um, I have some experience in this, um, the CDB or the World Bank, they do not look at, or the IDB, they do not, they do not look at um, where you're from. But it's, it's simply with what, what are your qualifications and your professional experience. So um, the, the message is that um, what, whatever is the situation that we face with now, continuous practice, continuous improvement, continuous education will get you into that um, into the market and being a, a, a player in the Caribbean market to start with. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Engineer Brown, can I have your comments? Okay, I would just like to say a special thank you to Engineer Gibbs and Ken for, for, this, for this contribution, for making themselves available and for, for, for sharing this information and updating us on the work that the Liaison Committee is actually doing. I, thanks to everyone who actually attended. I really hope this is the beginning of this kind of discussion that is actually going to help us to, one, build on the necessary image of engineering for success in this region, and also uh, to, to try to lobby so that people in government, people in the school system, and our really bright young students understand the value and the importance to society of coming into this, this profession. So I, I really want to thank everyone that made this possible. Thanks to you, uh, Vincent, for the work that you have done and for, that your team at the APS continues to do. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you very much, Colonel Brown. Um, Tony, your closing comments for the evening, sir? Well, I would like everyone to recognize that the demands on en the engineering profession in the Caribbean are greater than the demands in general of the engineering professions in the metropolitan countries. And therefore, we should set higher standards for our tertiary education and for our professional development through our, our national engineering associations. We must have even higher standards than the metropolitan countries. Thank you very much, Engineer Gibbs. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our webinar this evening. Uh, we've had a very interesting discussion around engineering reform 
from student selection to professional registration. I would like to encourage all of you who may represent various engineering um, associations regionally to certainly engage with your students, whether it is at the secondary level through persons such as Ms. Lynch, who, was night, um, who joined us this evening, right through to your community colleges, your universities, and to really reach out and engage because that engagement I think is lacking and we really need to do a bit more. And I speak collectively, we, we all need to do it a bit more so that the students who are coming in to the engineering disciplines, uh, whatever disciplines they may be, are better prepared and better aware of what it is that they're coming into. Um, I'd like to thank all of you and remind you, please do contact the office to claim your CPD points for this evening's session. Coming up next month in the month of November and um, following on from this event, we actually will have a webinar on technical education and its importance to national development. I think this follows on quite nicely given tonight's discussion. And that's going to be delivered by uh, Mr. Ian Drakes, who is the principal of the Samuel Jackman Prescott Institute of Technology. And um, that is going to be on the 11th of November at 6 p.m. via this same medium, the Zoom medium. So look out for this flyer that you've seen Kenton just put up. We'll start to circulate that and Trevor will certainly circulate it to our regional partners in case they would like to join us as well. Thank you so much. This, e this evening's um, session has been recorded and you can go onto the BAPE website to avail yourself of that recording in case you would have missed any a part of the session. I apologize for any questions that I was unable to feel given the time, but I thank you all for your engagement and for being here this evening. Thank you and a good night to everyone.